Hello everybody, my name is Cool Blue, and I bring you guys yet another video in the Small Box Big Game series. This is going to be me playing, a, or sorry, teaching, and talking about and reviewing uh, a board game called Castles of Burgundy. That's right, Castle of Burgundy, but not just normal Castle of Burgundy, this is Castle of Burgundy, the card game. The quintessential card game. Uh, this is definitely one of my favorite go-to solo games, and uh, <laughs> so much so that I actually recorded a video already, and uh, I played the rules slightly wrong, um, but I'm willing to play it again because it's a good game, and I need to make sure I teach it correctly. But anyway, but this is a, um, again, it's based on, uh, well, it's Castle Bergen, the card game. It's basically a card game version of the board game, and I haven't played a full game of the board game myself, uh, but I have hung out with people who have played the full board game. And uh, they said, uh, and they also played this one too, and they said that this is basically kind of like a very distilled version of the board game. It's like, you know, pretty simplistic, but also has some of the same feeling to it, has some of the same depth. But of course, they preferred the board game because it gave a lot more control over things. But we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it as we go along. And needless to say, um, this is one of my favorite games to talk about because it is criminally cheap. Uh, this is usually about $15, $14. Uh, for sale, uh, usually not for sale, just like our MSRP, and it always makes you wonder, like, why is this game so cheap? It's so good. It's such a good game. Like, this is definitely not one of your run-of-the-mill, like, you know, trashy games. This is definitely a really good, has a lot of depth, has a lot of teeth to it, has a lot of uh, strategy involved, and it's a really, really, really good game. Um, I always wonder why. I always wonder why is it so criminally underpriced. So, uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about the game. Um, oh, right. I have an, a little insert inside of here. I made this by myself. This doesn't come with the game, but I did make this because I wanted to make it easier to sort through the cards without having to shuffle too much. There was one point in time where I played this game maybe twice a day uh, for about a month straight. So, as you can see, I'm a pretty huge fan of this game. Uh, if you are familiar with the actual board game itself, you may notice some of the symbols, some of the cards. Uh, they kind of represent different things that came from the board game. And this is, of course, a derivative of the board game, so you know, it makes sense that they'll be similar. We got our goods, we have our animals right there, and then we have our locations. So, <clears throat> to kind of kick off this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and talk about the game and uh, as far as its components, and then give some comparisons between this and the board game from what I know, from what people have told me, and then we'll talk about a solo setup. And then we'll talk about uh, an actual playthrough, or then we'll do an actual playthrough, not talk about it. So let's get some of this stuff kind of sorted. All right. <clears throat> so in Castles of Burgundy, your goal in this game is to have the most victory points, and you get victory points by building up your estate. And once you build up your estate through certain, like doing certain tasks, uh, that will allow you to get more victory points. And the more victory points you have, the better. Um, this can play up to four people, just like the normal board game. Uh, I don't think it has an expansion for this one, but I think the actual board game has an expansion that can let you play higher play counts. But this will essentially let you, um, you know, kind of have the same experience, kind of distilled down to cards. And they do it in a very clever way. So let me put some of the stuff that we don't need out of the way over here. And we'll bring up uh, kind of things. So uh, here we have our estates. So this is our project area. This is our, oh, sorry. This is our project area where the little uh, schematic is. This is our estate uh, that sits right here in front of us. And this uh, is the storage area where you store your points. Um, and throughout the game, you'll be putting cards here to be built. And then after you build them, they'll move over to here uh, where you'll kind of show the things that you've achieved and the sets that you collected essentially. And then over here, you'll have your storage for other things like your animals, your silver, your workers. Uh, stuff like that that you can use during the game and also the things that count as victory points towards the end of the game so those are pretty much most of the most little pieces to talk about there uh, let me put these back in the box i don't need those <clears throat> and let's see uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to go ahead and explain a card breakdown and then we'll explain a round play and then afterwards we will talk about how to set up solo and we'll just move on with it you know we don't have to <laughs> belabor too much so let's go and break down some of these cards uh, as far as the cards go there are a few different cards there's a handful of cards I'll bring them up here so you guys can see them on the uh, overhead view I think I'll switch this one out so on the cards they have a few different pieces of information on, so on, on top of them um, the first piece of information of course is the dice at the top so this game if you know the castle of Burgundy, the board game it's a very very dice 
um, related game. It's not it's not completely random because of the dice. Uh, it's a very strategic dice, I should say. And in this game, they kind of pulled that over, translated over by having a dice generator, a random number generated in the dice, uh, through the cards. And they've done that by distributing distributing the dice values through the cards. And of course, that means that you will be using the cards for multiple things. So in this case, this particular card at the top, this is a dice value of two, that's a dice value of five, four, so on and so forth. Um, and of course, in other circumstances, if the cards are actually in our project area down here, if they show up like this, like this card for instance is a one, uh, that would count itself as a as a uh, dice value of one. So that means that in order to build that card successfully, I would need to play a dice of one. So I need to play a dice of one. And then moving on from there, um, you have the different color of cards. So for here, you have a tan card. This card counts for a specific type of thing. When you have a set of three of a thing, it will basically give you victory points. So at the end of the game, you'll count those points up. So hypothetically, if I had successfully built three of these similar tan cards, then at the end of the game for the set of three, it's all worth three points. So this entire set of three is worth three points. And I can build multiple sets if I want to. So if I build three purples, for instance, I get six points. As you see, purple's worth a whole lot of points. Um, and then blue, same concept, and yellow, same concept. Four points, respectively. Now, when you build a card successfully, they have special um, effects, which is where this little tape bar comes in. Uh, and down here, uh, you see that when you, successfully, when you successfully build this card, you can choose to pull a card from the play area, which we'll talk about later, from the play area into your project area. And it has to be a color that's either green, um, silver, or purple. And you can basically pull it for free once you've successfully built that card. For this one, note that there's no little thing let down there because that particular card can be played as a wild so you can either count it as his own separate set or count it as a wild towards another set now what I mean by that is that when I build a tan I can put the tan here and then if I build a purple later on I can choose to put the purple as its own separate set in my estate or I can add it to this set now when I add it to the set the value of this is not going to be six it's going to be three like everything else but as you can see um, it can help you complete some sets so the special power for purple is that it can be played as a wild. Moving on to the next one, the ships. The ship has a special power of allowing you to pull a shipped good. So these are the shipped goods down here. As you can see right under, well, right under the card. And there's three, three different types of shipped goods. There's, uh, they have a dice value of five and six, three, four, and then one and two. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and they have the respective things when you complete when you put a ship ship inside of your estate you basically get to pick one of these from the stack and we'll talk about how to set up later and then later on you can cash these in later for victory points these are not worth victory points by themselves you can convert them into victory points later on and last but not least we have the yellow which the yellow allows you to pull two workers from the um, stash so from the uh, public area and put into your storage and the way the workers work put one right here on top of it the worker allows you to do a plus or minus dice value so you essentially can turn a dice value from a three to a four from a six to a one because it wraps around and alternatively you can do the same thing for like a dice value of a three um, if I wanted to change a three to a one then I can play two workers when I play that one dice value or discard that one dice sorry discard that three dice value and that can reduce the number from three to two to one and then like I said it can do plus or minus so that is that part. Now, there's uh, three other cards that aren't out here. I'll talk about those later when they pop up. Um, actually, let me, let me go and talk about all of them since we're going through this. So we have these four talked about. Now, the next are to talk about are the animals, the silver, and the wild. And I have no wilds. Wow. As you can see, the wilds are rare. There we are, the wilds. So the, uh, the wild, the silver, and the animals. So the wild is a green card. As you can see, it's a green screen, so it's gonna <laughs> kind of shadow through it, or sorry, phase through it. So my apologies for the visibility on that. Um, but this one, once you complete it, you will get a dice value. You immediately get a dice value of your choice to be played at that time. Um, and then as you can see, it's only worth two points for that entire set. So these are not worth a whole bunch of points because they give you a nice, nice little power there. This next one is silver. 
Um, silver, basically, once you successfully complete it, you get two silver. Or whatever number silver says, in this case, is two. You get two silver to add to your storage. And I'll explain what silver does in a second. And last but not least, you have animals. Uh, when you get the animal card, when you successfully move or complete an animal from your project area to your estate, then you get to add an animal from the top deck from the animal stack and then add it to your storage. And at the end of the game, based on how many animals you have determines how many points you get. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So let's go ahead and move over to the focus of the silver. So the silver gives you a few cool actions. Um, during your turn, at the beginning of your turn or the end of your turn, you can discard three silver cards. And when you do, it gives you a special action, it gives you a special ability. Uh, you can also alternatively, um, at the end of your turn or the beginning of your turn, discard three silver and three work, or sorry, discard any number of silver or workers to get that number of victory points um, divided by three. So if you if you discarded uh, nine silver plus workers, whatever combination it was, then you can get yourself three victory points, which is a big deal. It's a lot of points, but also of course you know it's a lot of silver and workers that you're throwing away, so it may not be worth it, depending on what you're trying to do. So I think that's all I can really talk about without talking about the rest of the game. So let me go ahead and get all this shuffled up. And we'll actually set up ourselves a simulated game so we can explain the rest of the rules. So it could be fair. Oh, okay. <laughs> Gives a bad shuffle here because, you know, skills. Who needs skills when you have uh, humor, right? Right? I mean, it's kind of all I got going for me. But I digress. <clears throat> so in the game, uh, you are essentially using your dice to choose your actions, and you're using those actions very wisely. Um, during each turn, you will play six turns total. So each person will play six turns, and there's five rounds total. So these are the round cards down here. And this is uh, round A, round D, round E, and round B, round C. So we'll do A, C, and E. Ace! Yay! Oh, I think I had the spell backwards. Hold on. Aha! There we go. From left to right. Alright, so <clears throat> what this means is that um, during the round, you will be able to get special things. So if you are able to successfully complete a set of three during a round, you will get that as victory points towards the end of the game. So that's one thing you'll get. And then you'll also get one of these benefits of the round. Um, like I said, there's five rounds total. After the fifth round is over, the game ends. You count your points to see who wins. But for this one, for instance, for round one or round A, if you're able to successfully complete a set of three, you can get yourself either three victory points. You can get yourself two animals from the top of the decks. You can get yourself two goods from the top of the deck, uh, three silver or three workers. So as you see, in round one, it's kind of hard to do that. But if you're able to successfully achieve that goal, then you can get yourself some nice, a nice amount of uh, points and stuff. You know, resources set you up, up. And then, of course, round E, if you're able to get a set of three, you see that you only get a, you know, one silver, one worker. It's not that much, but it may it may make the difference. You never know. You never know. You never know. So I'll put these back in their order. Put it right there. Now, during a turn, the anatomy of a round, I should say, is that you will essentially have cards that are laid out in display. So let's go ahead and lay those out. I'm going to put my state, my project, my state, and my storage here. And you have the cards laid out in a dice pattern, like so. And these represent the um, dice choices you have. So, so we're going to go ahead and assume that I'm playing a two-player game against a opponent that doesn't exist, so, sure. So at the start of the round, for a two-player game, we're going to draw seven cards total. The first six we're just going to place out, and the seventh one we're going to place on this dice value. So what I mean by that is we're going to place this here, place that there, place that there. Mm -hmm. Well, let's jump it down and then place that here. And then the last one, we're going to look at the dice value, which is a five. We're going to put the fives. Okay, done. So now that we've done that, we're going to draw ourselves six cards per player. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And after we do that, we're going to take our individual stacks. We're going to put it in front of us. And then we're going to draw two. Now, this is the part that I messed up for some reason uh, last time I played uh, live. But once we draw, once during our turn, You'll essentially choose between one of these two to do an action. You'll discard one of these two dice you have in your hand, which I have a five and a two right now, and I can choose to do one action. Now note that these cards I don't look at as their type of card they are. 
I instead look at them as their dice value. So let's say I wanted to maybe have a good action for later uh, because I have two workers to start with. I'll put those over there. And uh, two silver to start with. And um, I, want, I want to go ahead and do a really cool action. So I'm going to go ahead and discard a card to do a thing. Now the options that I have when I discard a card are to discard the card for the dice value, to claim a card that matches the dice value. So let me just walk you through that. I'm going to discard this two. Actually, I'm going to discard this five and throw it out of the game. And I'm going to take one of these two. So this is the five. I'm going to take one of these two to add it to my project area. So let's say I want to do this one. So take this one, put it right there. Boom, done. Now my opponent goes, uh, my opponent, I'm not going to bother simulating them fully. Let's say my opponent wants to get up on the farm animal game. They take this. Actually, okay, let's do this. So my opponent's going to draw two of their cards. They're going to know what these are beforehand, and they're going to play one of these two. So my opponent is going to, uh, let's say they're going to discard this three to take this one. They're going to put it in front of themselves over there, uh, right there in front of their project area. And now they draw their hand back up to two. And of course, I would have drawn my hand back up to two beforehand. So now I have a two and a three to work with. So with this two and a three, I can choose to either take this card. Uh, I can't really use the three to take any of these cards. I can try to reduce this two using a worker. Reduce this two to a one to build this and get more workers. Or, or here's a better idea. I can choose to discard this two. Nah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I was going to say I can choose to discard this two to get a silver. Um, that's probably not the best of trades, so maybe not. Maybe I won't do that. Let's see. Let me go back. All right here we are. Uh huh. Uh, I'm looking for the discard actions. There we go. Okay, so I can choose to do that for a project. I can choose it out for a build um, as an action or action number three according to the rulebook because I can choose to sell goods. Uh, when I sell goods, I don't have any goods, but at the start of the game, you will start with one. So there we go. I can choose to do that, or I can choose to restock workers up to two, or I can choose to take one silver, or I can choose to convert silvers to victory points. And those are basically my actions. So in this case, um, with this three and this two that I have, I think it's best for me to go ahead and you know just get rid of a worker to get two workers and also get something building. So I'm going to go ahead and, ooh, actually, hmm. change of plans. I'm going to get rid of this three plus these two workers. So it's going to make it a one. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll give you this three plus one worker, sorry. And no, no, yeah, I'll give you this three plus these two workers to build this as a one. Now, the reason why I'm doing that is because I'm going to get two workers back by building this. So I'm going to do that. So discard these two workers. Discard that. And I get two workers back. So I essentially did a turn. Probably wasn't the most efficient thing in the world, but we're not focusing on efficiency right now. So now that I've done that, I'm going to draw my hand back up to two and hold this to the side. My opponent's going to go, and my opponent is going to, with their hand of two over here, they're going to play this two, also discarding a worker, because we're assuming that they had one. And they're going to build this animal. They're going to pull it over to their project area. Let's get this better. Better visibility. Boom, there you go. So they put it, they put it into their estate which is right here. So as you can see, this game does take it does have a pretty large footprint, so <laughs> please bear with me here. And after they do that, uh, they will do the action. And this particular action here that they have on the animal card is to basically take an animal from the animal stack, which is down here, and they can choose one of these animals to add. So they have a choice between a chicken or a chicken. So they'll take a chicken, put in their storage, boom, done. So that's another action they did. So we both did a build. Now it's back to me on my turn. I can choose to do anything that I want um, amongst the turns. I have a six and a two. So with this six, I'm actually gonna take this. So I'm gonna discard the six, take this animal, put it right there. Okay, feeling good about that. Draw my next card. My opponent goes, and they're going to play this four to take this ship, put it in their projects. All right, so is it for their turn? And then it's my turn again. Uh, with my turn, I'm going to go ahead and spin this two. Oh, sorry. Spin this two to build this animal. And with this animal, I'm going to take this cow, add it to my storage. And then I'm going to draw my last card. My opponent's going to continue with their turn. And as you see, it just goes back and forth, back and forth until everybody runs out of cards. Uh, my opponent 
if they hypothetically have two silver, what they're going to do, what they're going to do is they're going to go ahead and discard one of these. Oh, actually, I take it back. They're not going to discard one of these. They're going to discard this one instead to draw this and put in their projects. And know that your project area can only have a max of three cards. So you have to keep that in mind. So I'm going to draw the last card and ah, it's a three again. Sad days. Going back to me on my turn. I hope it's not a <laughs> too complicated so far. Um, on this turn, I'm actually going to go ahead and discard one of these two to get myself a silver. So what I mean by that is I'm going to discard this. Uh, let's say I'm discard this four. Sure. And now when I discard that four, I get to get a silver from the stock and add it here to my storage. And now once it's in my storage, I can discard these three silver at the beginning of my turn or the end of my turn. So I can do it at, right now since I have three silver. So I'm going to discard three silver. And when you do, you draw three cards from the uh, deck, same deck as before, draw three cards. And you look at these cards as the dice value or as the project's value. So what I mean by that is I can either choose to use this as a six, use this as a six, or use this as a five. Or I can choose to add one of these cards to my project area and throw the rest away. So those are my two choices. Um, in this scenario, given what I'm seeing on the board, um, I'm not like in the order of how things are playing out because I have a two left and I have a six, five, and a six. So not the best of pickups. And given what's out here on the board, it's all looking pretty, pretty uh, <laughs> not great. So this card in particular says I can take a card from my project area and put it into my estate. So I'm actually going to take this card and put it here. So I'm going to add that to my um, project area. And then I throw away the rest and my turn's over. My opponent continues. So remember, that was done at the end of my turn. So that's why my turn's over. Now my opponent's going to go. Uh, my opponent has two threes left. They don't really have much else to do. Um, they don't have any workers. So they're going to discard one of their cards. And when you discard one of your cards, you draw back. Uh, sorry, when you, they're going to discard one of the cards for workers. And when you discard one of your cards for workers, no matter what the dice value is, you draw back up to a max of two in your storage. Now you can have more than two workers. You can have more than two workers in your storage, but assuming you have zero, then you'll get two. But if my opponent had one in their storage, they would just draw one for that. So in this case, they had none, so they're gonna draw two and add it to their storage. So now next turn, they can use this as a plus or minus two, or sorry, plus or minus one to their dice value, All right? So it's my opponent's turn. Since I went first, I'm taking my last turn. Uh, with my last turn, let's see. Uh, oh, I can actually build this. Now nah, I don't want to build this because this is going to pull something in. So instead, I'm going to use this last two to pull it here. Or sorry, to pull this animal from the two sides to here. And I'll set myself up for next round for something cool. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Now it's back to my opponent's turn. They have this two in their hand. They want to use one of their workers to make this a Sorry, they have a three in their hand. They're going to use one of the workers to make it a two because they want to build this out here. So my opponent's going to discard this along with this to make it a two. And they take this silver, or sorry, they take the silver mine and they put it in their estate. And once they do that, they can take two silver from the uh, storage and they can put it, sorry, they can take two silver from the supply and they can put it in their storage. So they'll take two silver from here in their storage and now at the end of the turn they're going to go ahead and cash in three of these silver so one two three and throw it out of the game to draw three cards like i did last time and now they can choose to use these as either as dice values or to take these as projects so given that they're not sure what the next round is going to be like uh they're just going to go ahead and take one of these cards um hmm let's just say they took the animal sure may not be the best of moves, but that's what they did. And they're going to throw the rest away. And they're done with their turn. I'm done with my turn. That is the end of the round. And we keep going. Uh, we do that. We switch the round tracker to round B. We put out seven new cards. And then we keep playing. And we keep going until the game's over. So that's essentially how the anatomy of rounds work in this particular game. Uh, that's essentially how everything kind of plays out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and clear the board. And then we're going to set up a solo game, and I'm going to talk about how the solo game works. So um, bear with me while I get all this cleaned up. And while I'm while I'm cleaning up all this, uh, another thing to mention about this game is that, like I said, it's criminally cheap. Like, it's always really cheap. $15, $14, $11, wherever you might be able to find it. I always recommend people pick up this game, especially if you love strategy games with a lot of uh, depth. The solo playthrough is pretty, pretty competent. 
the solo opponent is pretty pretty uh <laughs> difficult to beat um i think in the previous recording that i did where i played the game wrong um i actually lost by one point and then uh afterwards kind of in the conclusion of the video i went back and looked back at my very last turn that i made my very 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 last turn that i made and i noticed that if i made a move slightly different if I just made a move slightly different on my very last turn, I could have won by one whole point instead of lost by two, lost by one point. So that just gives you an idea of just how tight, how tight the mechanics are in this game, uh, at least as far as playing the opponent, playing the uh, automated opponent. Now, of course, when you play against people who maybe aren't used to kind of playing kind of games, this is kind of a set collection slash dice selection slash hand management slash a whole bunch of slashes <laughs> involved, um, action point. Um, applying you have all these different mechanics kind of jumbled up in one just like the normal castles of burgundy um so if somebody's not used to playing that type of game they might struggle a little bit but still it's a very fun game very competent and um you can play it solo and the solo mode is pretty darn fun i think so i mean like i said i played it for about maybe twice a day literally twice a day um for about a month straight uh, because it was, it was just one of those good games and i can play it during my lunch break um at work and you know it's a nice peaceful way to kind of get through the day so <clears throat> here we are with a solo setup oh right I forgot to mention these uh, these cards are superlatives this is the last thing I'll mention before we go to the actual final solo uh, basically what this means is that whenever somebody hits one of these goals they will get that so the first person to uh, get a set of three of purples for instance will get one victory point and the first person to get one of each color, in this case, will get two victory points, and so on and so forth. There's uh, one for each set of three, and then there's four uh, sets of seven uh, for a four-player game. If you're playing a two-player game, you take the one and the three, and you just play with those two. But if you play a, a higher player count, four players, for instance, you put all, all four, one through four of the uh, point counters on that. All right, so let's put this away. Cause we won't need that anymore and uh, I think I can reach all that <laughs> I'm putting stuff that doesn't need to be on frame in frame uh, out of frame shuffle up these uh, goods here and animals get these animals shuffled up Shuff shuffled up shuffled up <laughs> there we go and at the start of the game, here's my storage. I'll put it way over here. Uh, so at the start of the game, I start with two workers, two silver. Uh, I start with one victory point, playing solo. Oh, these, I don't need to shuffle these, sorry. I don't know why I shuffle that. Um, but I start with one random good, which I'll start with a brown good. And then I take the good deck, the goods deck, and I split it in half uh, to the best of my ability. And that kind of set these somewhere off to the side, visible, but off to the side. So whenever I do a shipped good action, I can choose one of these two. Um, another thing when I didn't talk about before is when you ship a good, when you ship goods, when you do that action, you discard that particular die. So I can discard a five or a six for this good, for instance. And when you do, you ship all the goods of that type. So if I had this, for instance, hypothetically, if I had this in my storage, uh, this down here, and I decided to discard a five to ship goods, I would ship all of these goods that would go just off to the side out of the game, and uh, I would get two victory points, so one point per. So this is two victory points. I put it right there. So of course it behooves you to try to collect goods of the same type, because once you have goods of the same type, you'll be able to do more with your single action. So that's kind of, kind of the play there. And the animals, the way the animals score, there are four, four different types of animals. There are four different types of animals, and the animals score on a kind of interesting rolling scale. So if you have one animal, you get zero points. If you have two animals, you get one point. If you have three animals, you get two points. And if you have four animals, you get uh, four points. Now when I say animals, there's four different types of animals, so you need one of each type. You're trying to collect the whole set of animals. So that's how the point scoring happens on that particular aspect of things. So I start with one animal randomly, so I start with the pig. And we split that just like we talked about before with the goods, put it all to the side. So a sheep and a pig. And then I have to start with a random good again because I did a little revealing earlier on all that. Put that right there. Oh, sorry, I'll take this one. 
So for a solo playthrough, once again, I start with, in my storage, uh, two workers, two silver, one uh, victory point, one animal, one good. And then I take all of these superlatives, or uh, <laughs> points, I should say, that you can possibly score between me and the automata, or the um, automated player. And where are the rest of them? I think they're up here. Oh, yeah. And I kind of just lay them out, just so I can kind of see what's available, what's left. And between me and the solo um, bot that I'm going to be playing, uh, we're going to be trying to claim these. And essentially, at the end of each round, uh, we check if I'm ever behind in points, then, or if, if I ever have less points than the bot that I'm playing, then I lose the game immediately. But otherwise, we keep going. Otherwise, we keep going. Also, another rule when you're playing against a solo player, when you're playing against a solo bot, um, anytime they get a purple, which is the cloister, anytime they get a purple, then I will get a free victory point. And the reason for that is because the purples are worth quite a bit. They're worth six points once you have a full set. So the game just kind of gives you a victory point just to offset that by a little bit. All right. So I think that's pretty much it. So let's uh, get this round counter back to round A. And we're going to set up the uh, the automatic player, or the automata, which his name is uh, Adam. Is it Adam? No, it's Aaron. Sorry, his name's Aaron, according to the rule book. So we're going to deal out three cards, four cards, five cards, six cards, seven cards for five different rounds. So let's do one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So every round, Aaron will play all of their cards at the same time. They'll collect whatever superlatives that they have, and then they'll also, um, well, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's pretty much it. So I'm going to put their decks off to the side here because we don't really need to have you see everything. And I'll reveal their first set of cards. So Aaron is going to have one blue already and then two tans. So if they have a third tan, for instance, then they would automatically take this, assuming that I haven't cleaned it myself. So I need to be very careful about that because that's points that I'm giving away if I don't take it. Okay, so we have the setup over here for me. Everything's ready to go. Uh, I think this is gonna be just as messy as it was before, so <laughs> we're gonna keep the uh, discard and cards over here, and hopefully it won't be too confusing. Uh, I could shift this over a little bit, but it's a little bit, yeah, let, let me shift this over because we have all this space over here I'm not using. And it's getting a little cramped already. Oh, right, there's also this token. So the first time anybody ships, which is only going to be me, then they'll get that card, and that card represents one victory point. So that's going to count as one victory point once I ship a good, assuming I ship a good, which I'm pretty sure I'll be shipping goods at least once. If I don't, then I feel like I'm just going to have a horrible game all around, and I may be doing bad things. Not in a good way, more like a playing badly type thing, you know, like having a bad day, singing a sad song, just to turn it all around. I, don't know, I forgot the words of that song. Alright, so these are Aaron's cards, and the rest of his cards are off to the side. There's our deck. These are our superlatives. So the first to do any of these will be able to get those. Okay, and oh, that's a little cricket. There we go. Make this a little bit straighter. Good enough. Alright, so it's going to start with the first round. We're going to draw seven cards, and we're officially starting a solo playthrough. So this is the setup. Aaron drew his first cards. We're going to play the first cards for the uh, splay. Two, three, four, five, six. And then your seventh card here. And I forgot to mention, uh, during a normal game, once the round is over, you clear the display and you put out new cards. Um, I, I assume that was um, implied, but I just want to clarify just to make sure. One, two, three, four, five, six for me. And now I will draw two. All right, so I drew a six and a three. So with this, uh, I think it's kind of telling me, well, I really want to build that cloister up there because I found that building cloisters is actually a really good idea. Um, but there's a lot of yellows out here and I don't want to, I don't want to lose my opportunity to build yellows, but I'm, I'm going to bank on the fact that I might have a four later. So I'm going to spend this six. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm bank on the fact that I might have a six later. I'm going to spin that six and throw in a discard. 
And I'm going to take this, put it in my estate, draw my next card. And now I have a two and a three. So I'm going to spin this two to get this here. Draw my next card. I have a one and a three. Um, I think with this, I'm going to go ahead and spin this three to build this. So I used the dice, discarded the dice value to build this into my state. So I have my first card in my state. Doing pretty good so far. My next card, uh, hmm, yeah, looks like, oh, sorry. After I finish this, I get myself two workers from the supply and add it to my storage. So now I have four workers down here for dice value ma manipulation. I'm gonna go ahead and spin this one to take this down here. Then I'm gonna take my last dice value from my deck and ooh, this is tough. So I'm not going to be able to finish a set of three, sadly, because I didn't focus um, good enough. Um, but, but what I can do is I can spin the four to take this purple, right? So now I have six, sorry, three cards down here max. So I can only have three cards down here total. And then, oh, and then I can go ahead and spin this plus this to build my first cloister. Um, so I discard this and discard that and I can either build the cloister or build this or I can actually use it to build this instead too. So give me wor more workers for next round. I think with this I'm gonna go ahead and build the cloister. I should be able to build these with natural dice values. I just don't want to waste too much of my workers here. Alright that's it. Round one is done. So now we check the score. My victory point score is 1 versus Aaron's victory point score of zero. So I'm still winning. So we move on to the next round. We move on to round B. So we clear this play. We draw new cards. And there we go. So we draw the six like normal and then we put this one here where the number is. And then we continue playing. And that's basically how you play, oh, sorry, draw my six. Two, three, four, five, six. And then I draw Aaron's card. Well, I'll, I'll save Aaron's cards for a second. But that's basically how you play um, Castle of Burgundy solo. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this video here. And then I'm going to um, start up a second video so I can show you the rest of the playthrough. But I hope that this was informative. I hope this showed you how to play the game. As you can see, it's relatively quick to play. We play, we explained the rules and talked about um, everything we need to talk about as far as how the game works and then we played our first round of the solo play, so we'll continue in a second video, but thank you guys very much for watching, hope you guys enjoyed it, and as always, I will see you guys whenever.